gives each winding path I tread Gives me strength for every trial And he feeds me with the living bread And though my weary steps may falter And my soul a thirst may be Gushing from long before Though a spring of joy I see And all the way My Savior leads me All the fullness of His love Perfect rest to me is promised In my Father's house above Jesus led me all the He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. And by him all things were created in heaven and earth, seen and unseen, rulers, dominions, and powers, and kings. He holds all
Good morning, Center Point. Good morning. Good morning, Chuck. Good morning. 
Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's time to rise and shine. Would you guys please stand up and join us as we worship the Lord together this morning? We're so glad you're here. Let's just lift our voices up to the Lord and worship the one that raised us, saved us, and gives us new life. You may be seated. Welcome to Center Point. We're so glad to worship with you this morning. My name is John, and I'm here. <laughs> yeah, not. John's actually going to be bringing the word this morning. He's going to be preaching for us. Isn't that going to be awesome? No pressure there, buddy boy. Sorry. Um, but we're here just to worship the Lord this morning, and so glad you're here. We've got a few announcements. I don't remember. I think it's three. Logue, let's do those real quick. The first one is we have our men's prayer breakfast coming up on July the 10th. So men, this is our men's ministry. It's a time we get together and spend some time uh, just spending time with each other, praying for our families and having some fellowship together. Followed on that same day on July 10th is an evangelism and outreach. You'll notice some of those folks you recognize. They're walking around to see some people you don't recognize in our neighborhood, going from door to door to share the most important message our neighbors have never heard. And then after that, uh, we're going to have our lady support group. And that is on the 17th, a week later. And you can see Annette Baker if you have any questions about that. That's a time specifically designed for uh, our ladies that are going through some hard time and just to grow together and to fellowship with each other and to trust the Lord as they walk in this crazy world. This morning, we're here to lift our name up. No, that's the rest of your week. This morning, we're here to lift his name up, right? Amen. We're going to do that first off by reading a verse together. If you would stand up, we're going to read this, our uh, call to worship together. This comes from the book of Psalms. Let's read this. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Of a 
the sunset's glory, amazing artistry across the evening sky. When I feel the mystery of a distant galaxy, it awes and humbles me to be loved by God so Chris, can I get you to cut the lights a bit? Thanks. This, as we move into our next song, we want to take some time to just bow our heads. This is not a time for you to hear someone. This is a time for the Lord to hear you. So if you have some sin you need to confess, if you just want to get right with the Lord, if you just want to tell him how much you love him, just bow your head for a moment and spend some time just talking to the Lord, please.
seat saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast, precious in his holy sight. He will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. But by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Grace with him to endless life. He will hold me fast. Till I fail his turn to sight. When he comes at last. Lord, we praise you with all the problems in the world that we are in your hands and you hold us fast. We praise you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. In Christ's name, amen. This time we want to dismiss children, second grade and under, to Children's Church in the back. The rest of you may have a seat. this time, we're going to ask Randall Smith to come up and lead us in a time of prayer, please. Well, happy 4th of July to each and every one of us. Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful for your mighty son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that he laid down his life for us. He uh, went to that cross knowing full well um, what lay ahead for him and for his bride, the church. He laid down his life for us. He shed his precious blood to pay one time and one time only, once for all, for all that uh, the Father, you, Father, have given him, the bride of uh, his bride, and we are his bride. Father, we thank you so much uh, for this country that you've given us, that you've uh, allowed us to live in, and uh, we thank you so much for the freedoms uh, that under your supervision you have allowed men to decide upon. Uh, Father, we're living in troubling times. And, of course, believers have said that for hundreds of years now. These are likewise very troubling times. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus that they would not lose faith. 
pray for our brothers and Christ who's in Christ, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus that they would not uh, equate uh, the United States with the church. For though there are so many believers in this country, uh, we are not the church. We are your bride. The, the uh, no country is your bride, only individuals. And there, as we spoke earlier, there are no grandchildren. You have children only in your church. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ and ourselves that we would uh, not place our hope in men or in governments, but that we might uh, declare our faithfulness to you. And we might declare our obedience and uh, pray for our obedience to you, Lord. And uh, may we may you, may we bring you great glory among those who are patriots who do love this country. May we declare your great glory, and may we may, may we live godly lives uh, in front of others who are believers and who are not believers. May we declare our faithfulness and live out faithful lives to others, that others may see the Lord Jesus Christ see the work of the Holy Spirit alive in our lives and want to know about the Savior that motivates us, the Savior who we know who rescued us. Father, won't you uh, please today as we meet together and for that matter as millions meet together, won't you uh, open our minds and hearts to your word? Won't you give John clarity of thought and speech? Um, that we may hear your word and bring you great, great glory. Father, we pray for those not with us who are not well today. Would you please uh, come to their aid? We're thankful to look around and see many that are here with us, some uh, in great need. Father, may the Lord Jesus Christ be our hope. May we call on you daily, Lord, uh, to meet these needs. May we call on you daily to uh, sustain us and to uh, provide for us. Father, may we, uh, may we be found faithful. As the song says, may those who follow after find us faithful. Father, please give us uh, uh, peace and quiet this morning as we hear your word. May it change our lives. May our lives be different through this week. For having grown in Christ Jesus. And we pray these things in his mighty name. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Admittedly, it is a little awkward this morning um, because I'm here at this moment, not there earlier or later on. So I appreciate Wayne and Carolyn for uh, filling in for me this morning. Um, there, was, there was a few moments about a couple weeks ago when I did think about, you know, looking at everyone else at the teach, on the teaching team, the preaching team, that maybe I should try and grow a goatee much like everyone else has. But then I realized I can't grow any facial hair. So uh, I have avoided that this morning, and uh, I really wanted to, but Lauren told me no. So it just looks terrible. You guys don't want to see it. Um, but this morning we'll be looking at Psalm 138. But before we get in, I want to pray for us. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to hear from your word. I do pray that you would speak to us from your word this morning, that we would be attentive, convicted, and encouraged. In your name, amen. So there's an age-old question out there, and it's simply this. Have I ever steered you wrong? Now, most, more often than not, you've probably heard that question from those individuals who uh, have steered you wrong in the past. And they just want to make sure that, you know, hey, you can trust them. But deep down, you, deep down inside, you do know, when you hear that question, you're going to answer with a resounding yes. You have steered me wrong in the past. So whatever you're going to tell me, whatever you're going to tell me to do, I'm not going to do it because I don't trust you. In fact, in high school and in some of my college friends, none of you guys here, of course, but... Some of my high school friends, college friends, and even friends at DTS, they have steered me wrong. And so if they ever ask me that question, I will also answer with a resounding, yes, you have steered me wrong. I'm not going to do it. 
I'm not going to do it. The, the point is, is they have never proved themselves to be trustworthy. So therefore, I simply cannot place my trust in them. They have steered me wrong, and I know they will likely steer me wrong again. But let me pose this question to you with a different subject in mind. Has God ever steered you wrong? Now, immediately all of us would jump out of our chairs and say, no, of course not. He's never steered me wrong. Why would he do that? I know the Bible. I know scripture. He'll never steer me wrong. But what about last month when a family member or friend died? Or last year when you experienced extreme spiritual drought? Or maybe last week when you spent more time in a doctor's office than in your own home? Or maybe the past Years and months where you've, ex you've experienced so much pain that you have no idea what to do about it. The pain just keeps on coming. It's almost a guarantee that for most of us, myself included, those moments cause us to think that perhaps God has steered us wrong in the past, is steering us wrong, and maybe even will steer us wrong. Amidst trouble, we often doubt his good hand, his provision of strength, grace, mercy, and love. We trust him now. But when trouble comes, it's very difficult to find the trust that we once had. We begin to think that maybe God has steered us wrong. So this begs the question, how can we develop trust in God during trouble? I'll say it again. How can we develop trust in God during trouble? Now, thankfully, the Lord has given us his divine revelation. So I think we can look inside of it in Psalm 138 and discover the answer to our question. Now, we're unsure of the historical context of Psalm 138. You know that many psalms have a historical context. But for Psalm 138, they're really not sure. And uh, I think this morning we'll be just fine just going through the text to discover the answer to our question, how can we develop trust in God during trouble? So let's read Psalm 138 together. I will give thanks, O Lord. I will give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name in your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. But the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. So in this passage, it's divided into three sections, but I think we discover two steps that can help us move toward trusting God during trouble. And this is the first step. Look back and praise God for his faithful character. We, we need to look to the past, look at the past at what he has done and give him thanks for his faithful character. Look back and praise God for his faithful character. We see this in verses 1 through 3. Now, verses 1 through 3 could be split up into two sections, the way to give God praise, and then why to give God praise. So let's look first at the way to give God praise. We see this in verse 1. David says, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. So the first way is wholeheartedly. David is not just giving thanks to God because he must. He is making a willful choice, and he is doing it with this whole being. You'll see in verses 1 and 2, he says, my whole heart. And then later on, before the gods, I sing. That's his mouth. And then verse 2, I bow. That's his whole body. His whole being is involved in giving thanks and praise to God. Now, I'm not sure if you've ever been around a bunch of elementary students who have just heard a special presentation from another teacher or a special guest. Usually at the end of the time, the teacher will get up and say, all right, kids, make sure you give this person a thank you. And what follows is probably the most monotone and sad-sounding thank you. I've experienced this many times, but it usually sounds something like this. Thank you. Just a huge chorus 
of 15, 20, 30 children delivering the most mundane thank you ever. It doesn't really make much of a difference. That is not the kind of thank you I'm talking about. I think that's very clear. We're not talking about some sort of forced, mundane, um, because we have to kind of thank you. David is not just giving God some outward Christianese expression of worship. He is willfully giving thanks to God with all of his being. So that's the first way to give God praise. Second way is boldly. We see this also in verse 1. He says at the end of verse 1, Before the gods I sing your praise. Now this is a bit confusing because David almost seems to concede the existence of other gods. It's almost like, you know, for you to sing praise before other gods, they actually have to be there. Right? So it's almost like he's saying, yeah, the other gods exist, but you're the true one. That's not really what, God, what, what David is saying. Rather, it's saying that all praise given to the one true God is always done in the face of others who claim to hold the position of deity. David is boldly proclaiming that God alone deserves the praise, not the supposed gods of all the other nations. One commentator put it this way. He said, biblical praise is always both praise of the true Lord and praise against all false lords who seek to set themselves up in God's place. So whenever you praise, whenever you give thanks to God, you are always doing it and declaring he is the one true God. All these down here, they are not. So that's what David is boldly proclaiming as he worships the Lord. So David gives God praise, first of all, wholeheartedly, secondly, boldly, and finally, humbly. We see this at the beginning of verse 2. It says, I bow down toward your holy temple. Now we know in the Old Testament, the temple is the place where God dwells. And so David, as the king of Israel, is bowing down before this holy temple. And this is an act of submission. Think about this. The greatest king of Israel, possibly in Israel's history, many think, bowing down before the Lord as he boldly praises the Lord with his whole heart. Remember, this guy is a guy after God's own heart. He is a man after God's own heart. And yet here he is bowing down before the Lord in full, complete submission. David is acknowledging that even though he might be the king, there is one who was higher than him, who deserves all the praise for absolutely everything. And so David praises God humbly. So the way we praise God is crucial with our whole heart, wholeheartedly, with boldness, and finally with humility. But David doesn't just describe the way to give God praise. He also describes why to give God praise. And there are actual reasons. Again, this isn't a forced, David isn't doing this because he has to. He has legitimate actual reasons to praise God. And I'll say this, so do we. And we'll see this here. The first reason is for his steadfast love. We see this in verse 2. Read with me. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love. So why do we give God praise? First, for his steadfast love love. Think for a minute about the fickleness of your own love. I know that I can easily transition from loving one minute to hating the next minute. The transition is so fast, I'm not even sure what happens half the time. And yet here we have God who displays steadfast or loyal love toward us despite the fact that we don't deserve it. Steadfast means that it's never going to stop. I know we all know that. We all know that's what steadfast means, but we often have a difficult time actually understanding that his love is literally never going to stop, ever. He has never once stopped loving you. Now, the question is, do you think that's praiseworthy? I hope we all say yes. Then how are you doing praising him for his steadfast love? When was the last time you did that? So why to give God praise? First, for his steadfast love. Second, for his faithfulness. He adds this at the end of verse 2, or in the middle of verse 2, and your faithfulness. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 37, 25, and it says this, I have been young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. How often we fail to see just how faithful God has been throughout all history. When things go wrong in our lives, we immediately like to blame God. And think that somehow, some way, he has been unfaithful to me. But it's not that God, it isn't even that God hasn't failed us yet. For that little word yet 
leaves the possibility that he could fail you in the future. But that is not ever, ever going to happen. Uh, one of my favorite people in the world who has since passed uh, several months ago, Harry Ballback. He uh, worked for Word of Life and actually found a Word of Life, which if those of you who are familiar, uh, that's the ministry that I come from, that I grew up around up in New York. But he always said this, God hasn't failed anyone yet, and you're not important enough for him to make history over. In other words, <laughs> in other words, he has never and will never steer anyone wrong. Now the question is, do you think that's praiseworthy? I hope we all say yes. So how are you doing praising him for it? When was the last time you praised him for his faithfulness? So why to give God praise for his steadfast love, for his faithfulness, and finally for his promises? We see this at the end of verse 2. He says, For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Now this phrase is a bit difficult. Some of your translations may have it a little differently. Um, but I think most scholars have agreed that this difficult phrase is referring to the promises of God. In looking at the context, David has just talked about the faithfulness of God. So it makes complete sense that he now talks about God's faithfulness in regard to God's words. God has exalted his name and his promise so that all may be able to see that God fulfills his words. Many scholars believe that this is a reference to 2 Samuel 7 where the Davidic covenant was established. But even if it doesn't directly refer to that, it is clear that what David is trying to say is that God has kept his word with him. Now, do you think his faithfulness to his word is praiseworthy? Again, I hope we all say yes. So how are you doing praising him for it? When was the last time you praised him for his faithfulness to his word? Now all this, his steadfast love, his faithfulness, his promises, is, becomes demonstrated in a personal example in verse 3. Verse 3 says, On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. So David realizes that God has demonstrated his steadfast love, his faithfulness, and his faithfulness to his word in his own life. You know, we often, in the midst of trouble, fail to see how God has demonstrated those three aspects in our own lives. But trust me, he has. He has. But notice something here. David did not say that the Lord changed the situation or circumstance. The Lord's answer changed David and gave him strength. One commentator put it this way, It's not always the situation that most needs changing. It is, as often as not, the man involved in it. But nonetheless, David saw even that provision of strength, which how often do we see a simple provision of strength as a, a demonstration of God's steadfast love, faithfulness, and promises. But David saw that, that provision of strength, as praiseworthy and as a demonstration of God's faithful character. As we forget so many times to praise the Lord for his faithfulness in the past, and we wonder why we fail to see his faithfulness in our present trials. Our failure to look back and praise him for his faithful character will result in a failure to praise him and trust him during trouble, period. If we aren't praising him now for what he's done, then who's to say that we'll praise him then amidst trouble? But when we constantly look back and praise him for his faithful character, we will realize this essential truth. He hasn't failed us in the past, so he will not. He will not fail us in the future. We are such a forgetful people. So oftentimes it takes some work. But if you're looking back and praising God now, it will and it might develop into a habit so that even during trouble, you can continue to praise and thank him, knowing that he will prove himself faithful over and over and over again. You will begin to realize that his track record with you is exactly what makes him worthy of your trust. He hasn't steered us wrong in the past, so you know you can trust him for the future. One thing we can do is keep a running list of things that God has done. Like I said, we need, we as humans, we are forgetful people. So maybe start writing things down at the end of every day, week, or month. And, this is important, review them. 
and give God, basi- give God thanks on a regular basis. Maybe you can even develop this into a habit you can do individually or with your family. This is great as a whole family to sit down and write things and go over things that the Lord has done. He has been faithful. Praise him for it. So look back and praise God for his faithful character. So not only must we look back and praise God for his faithful character, we must also look up and believe in God's gracious care. Look toward him and believe that he cares for each one of us. This is seen in verses 4 and 6. Verses 4 and 6. So David now turns to the fact that someday all the kings of the earth will praise the Lord. Let's look at verse 4 together. He says, All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. Notice that all the kings of the earth will praise him. Even the most powerful kings on the earth. Why? Because they have heard the words of his mouth. In other words, they will praise God for, the, for his ability to keep his word. David is looking forward to a day when all the earth will be aware that God remains faithful to his promises. Verse 5 continues. It says, And they shall sing of the way of the Lord. Notice what's happening here between verses 4 and 5. In verse 4, all the kings praise the Lord for his words. And in verse 5, all the kings praise the Lord for his ways. Understand this. God's words and his ways will never, ever contradict. We do not read phrases in Scripture like, God is good, or God is faithful, or as we see in the New Testament, I am with you. We don't read those phrases only to discover that God's actions do not match his words, regardless of what we think or feel. With God, his actions always match his words. So that even the greatest kings of the earth will acknowledge this fact and praise him one day for it. Now I think the end of verse 5 sums up what the kings of the earth are praising the Lord for. He says, For great is the glory of the Lord. Now we often have a hard time understanding exactly what is meant by the word glory. It's a term we hear hear used described to God all the time. God is glorious. God is glorious. We've kind of gotten used to it. But I think in some ways the technical definition of the word glory can help us understand it a little bit better. It's defined as this, essence and power reserved only for God. Essence and power reserved only for God. This kind of glory only describes him. That's it. No great king, no great leader is as glorious as as God. That term only ever describes the Lord. But there will come a day when all of us, from the least to the greatest, even the greatest of our kings, will praise God for his word and his ways, for he is far glorious than any of us can ever imagine. I think back to King Nebuchadnezzar, who is quite possibly the greatest king of all history. We see that he himself bowed before the Lord and gave the Lord praise. The greatest kings of earth will one day do that to our Lord because he is very much deserving of it. He is very, very glorious, more than we can even imagine. Now you might be saying at this point, wow, John, this is great. This is really cool. But whatever happened to believing in a God who graciously cares for us? I mean, right now it kind of sounds like God is just so far above us humans, we could do nothing about it. I love talking about the glory of the Lord, but I still don't see your point. That doesn't really sound gracious or caring. But this is where verse 6 comes into play. And this should be astounding. Because verse 6 ultimately tells us, Though God is far greater than us, He cares for us. Though God is far greater than us, He cares for us. I don't think we fully grasped or understood the glory of the Lord until we understand this great contradiction. David spells it out for us in verse 6. He says, For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Do you see this great contradiction? In verses 4 and 5, we have a description of the glory of the Lord that is so great, so awesome, that he is deserving of praise from the highest and greatest of kings. But here... David says he regards the lowly. 
he regards lowly. Now, growing up around two sisters and now being married to Lauren, I have watched what most people call um, period pieces. And if you're not familiar with period pieces, these are shows and movies that are set back in a certain time period, like 1600s, 1700s. And in most of these shows, they try and reflect the culture of that time. And so therefore, a lot of them go to great lengths to show that nobles only hang out with nobles. You know, kings only throw fancy parties for rich people. And rich people only throw fancy parties for their friends and for other rich people. Very rarely do we see lowly and poor people get involved in these parties. In fact, if they do, it's kind of awkward. But here, contrary to what we might expect, God regards the lowly. Admittedly, that's even our own culture. Like usually hang out only with like. We very rarely actually invite people who are unlike us, poor people, lowly people, people who are lower on the totem pole, so to speak. We very rarely invite those people to hang out with us. But here, the fact that the Lord even casts a glance in the direction of the lowly should astound us, should absolutely amaze us. Usually in many of these movies and shows, the lowly and the poor are seen as detestable. Kings won't even go near him. And yet here, David says, the Lord regards the lowly. That is a contradiction of magnificent proportions. And we really need to understand that. The word regard here means that the Lord is aware of the problems encountered by the lowly, and he takes care of them. Again, can you believe that? That doesn't make any sense. We, we often get so used to this concept of God cares for you. You know, cast your burdens on the Lord and before he cares for you. That's something that we, we just get used to. It's normative for us. It doesn't astonish us anymore. But in these few verses, we have a beautiful picture of our God who was altogether transcendent beyond us and yet imminent, close to us. A God whose greatness and glory stretch far beyond our imagination, and yet a God who cares for the lowly. This should be absolutely mind-blowing. Absolutely mind-blowing. But David continues to say at the end of verse 6, but the haughty he knows from afar. In other words, God knows everyone and everything by nature of his sovereignty. But for the proud, he only knows them from a distance. He doesn't regard them and care for them as he does for the lowly. I'm reminded of what we hear in the New Testament from James 4, 6, and 1 Peter 5, 5. God opposes the proud. And I think a, one commentator summarized it well. He said, within the Lord's domain, those who are self-sufficient do not receive his help, but those who are humble enjoy his assistance. So do you see what's so astounding and incredible in these verses. This is more than just a simple prince in the pauper situation. This is the God of the universe who deserves praise from the greatest of kings caring for people like you and me. When I went to school up at Word of Life Bible Institute, it was during the first few years that my dad was president and CEO. Uh, he had just become that a few years back, and so people were still getting used to the idea. But I can remember how stunned some of my friends were when I went up to the president and CEO and talked with him, hugged him. I mean, they were completely astounded. I mean, to them, I was their fellow student and friend, and even more so, I worked in the dish pit. Like, that was my job. I, were, I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning to work in the dish pit. So to them, I was even, like, yes, I was their friend, but I was even lower. I was like the lowest of the lows. If you've ever been in a dish pit, just don't go. It's bad. So that's who I was. And so they were astounded that although I was the lowest on the totem pole, I had an intimate relationship with the president and CEO of Word of Life. They were awestruck. But as some of them found out later, he is my father and I'm his son. And in the same way, but also in a much, much greater way, this God who deserves praise from the greatest of kings of all the earth he is our father, and we are his sons and daughters. We often ask during trouble, where are you, God? Why have you abandoned me? But these questions come from someone who has let their circumstances determine who their God is. But we who are Christians and are counted among the lowly, we know what the word of God says about him. We know 
that he is right there, graciously caring for us as any loving father would do. His way of caring might look different than the way that we thought or maybe that we thought he should care, but that just demonstrates that maybe we don't quite have a full picture of him yet. What we can count on every time is that we have an intimate relationship with the sovereign God, and he cares for us. And just like the reaction of some of my friends to discovering that I have this intimate relationship with the president of Word of Life, this also should blow our minds. Let me say it again. Though the Lord is exalted, he regards the lowly. I would encourage you to even memorize these verses as an aid to remembering that God cares for you, or even the psalm that I said earlier, Psalm 37, 25. Memorizing scripture is a great way to believe that God cares. Now, one of the things that I don't think Lauren and I meant to do this initially, but it has turned out well for us, is that many of you know that for the first seven months of our marriage, we were restricted to a hotel room. We lived in a hotel. And so as a joke for Christmas, we got ourselves an ornament. And this ornament was a door. And on it was written our hotel room number, 224. And we did it initially as a joke, just to remember. But over the course of the past several months, as we've been able to move back into our apartment, I've realized that that ornament can serve as a precious reminder of the Lord's faithfulness in our lives, that we can look forward to Christmas to putting up that ornament and saying, I remember room 224. I remember what that was like. The Lord is faithful. And even in those moments that were super difficult for Lauren and I, now we can look back and never forget every Christmas as we put that ornament up. And maybe you need to do something similar. Maybe when something happens, you need to have a physical object of some sort, whether it's a picture or something like that, to remind you of the faithfulness of the Lord and his gracious care for you. So how can we develop trust in God during trouble? Well, first of all, look back and praise him for his faithful character. And second, look up and believe in God's gracious care. We see in our passage in verses 1 through 6 that David has been practicing these things. But now in verses 7 and 8, David turns to his present reality and to the troubles that surround him. But because he has already looked back and praised God for his faithful character and looked up and believed in his gracious care, he can look forward and trust God during trouble. Look forward and trust God during trouble. So when we do these steps, these moves, much like David has done in the first six verses, we should be able to say this with David in verse 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. Verse 8. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Talk about a beautiful statement of trust beautiful statement of trust. But notice, God did not remove David from the trouble. Yet amid the trouble, David still acknowledges, one, God's sovereignty. We see this demonstrated in verse 7. He says, your hand twice. He refers to the Lord's hand twice. In the Old Testament, this usually refers to strength, deliverance, and power, specifically of God. And here, David, David says, that same deliverance, strength, and power is over my enemies. You see, David's earlier acknowledgement of God's faithful character and gracious care now feeds into these final two verses so that David now knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is sovereign even over his enemies. We cannot miss the connection here. The connection between David praising God, believing God, and now he is able to trust God. He knows that God will take care of him, revive him, and deliver him. So David, even amidst trouble, still remembers God's sovereignty and finally still remembers the steadfast love of the Lord. We see this in verse 8. In verse 8, it says, The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. So based on what David has already acknowledged, remember back in verse 2, he said he gives thanks for his steadfast love. So now in the midst of trouble, because David has already reflected on the steadfast love of the Lord, he is now able to do it in the midst of trouble. 
David knows that the steadfast love of the Lord never runs dry. Though the days are difficult, the Lord will finish what he started. So finally, that last sentence there, David ends with a request. Now this request is not a contradiction to, the, to, the, to his previous trust in God. Rather, it's a prayer of faith. He reminds God that he is God's handiwork, and thus he implores God to not let him fall and shatter. This is an expression of faith and a prayer that is according to the will of God. Now, I think it's pretty clear so far that developing trust in God doesn't happen overnight. It's a lifelong journey. I can assure you, though, with 100% confidence that it is not God's fault that you don't trust him. He has given us all the proof we need. I think for most of us, if not all of us, we can all easily admit that we do not praise God for his faithful character enough, nor do we believe in God's gracious care like we should. For me, I'm guilty on both accounts. But in doing these steps right now, even in the good moments, we can develop trust in him. They equip us for whatever is ahead so that even amidst trouble, we can continue to trust in him. Like I said at the beginning, it's easy to trust him now. It's really easy. If we were to ask, if I were to ask, has God ever steered you wrong? Like at the beginning, a resounding answer would be no. No. And so, why not develop that trust that we already have by doing these things? Look back and praise God for his faithful character. And then look up and believe in God's gracious care so we can look forward and trust God during trouble. Now, many of you are aware of the struggles that Laura and I have had over the past 11 months, and we appreciate your, your guys' willingness to listen, to pray for us. Some of you have even said, that's not what your first year of marriage is supposed to look like. And I don't know what a first year of marriage is supposed to look like. I've only experienced this one. So I don't know, but I'll take your word for it. But it has certainly been a year in which we have struggled to trust God. We've experienced spiritual drought, pain, and sickness, and other ridiculous situations that many of you have probably heard of. But I realized in preparing for the sermon that I had forgotten all about the Lord's faithful hand in the past. I really had. Last week, I realized that I had forgotten it. You see, when I was 13 years old, I was experiencing some significant knee pain, but doctor after doctor had no idea what was going on, on and they had no idea how to fix it. All they said was that I needed to use crutches and a leg brace. And so as a 13-year-old kid who absolutely loves sports, this was terrible, terrible news. I was on crutches for about a year and a half, and it was absolutely terrible as a 13-year-old kid. I mean, I can still remember sitting on my mother's bed, on my parents' bed, and asking my mother, why is God doing this to me? As I watched my brother play outside. It was terrible, absolutely terrible. I questioned God as a 13, 14-year-old unlike I ever have before. It was, it was really, really terrible. But as I continued to be on crutches periodically, year after year, eventually we found a surgeon who knew what to do about it. And so thankfully, he fixed my knee, and it is all good, and I haven't had any issues with it since. But without those two terrible years, I would not be where I am today. Why? Because it's during those two years that I found music. I found I loved guitar. I found I loved to sing. I'd forgotten all about it. <laughs> the Lord had certainly proved himself faithful. And last week, I forgot all about it. Didn't even think about it once these past 11 months. And as a result of not remembering and not looking back, I thought maybe God didn't care. And anytime something bad happened to Lauren or myself, I'd get angry, get angry at God and ask him, what, what are you doing? Why are you doing this to us? My failure to look back and praise him for his faithfulness and my refusal to believe in his care led to a lack of trust. I couldn't believe that I had forgotten one of the most pivotal moments of my life where God had displayed his faithfulness to me. I wouldn't be here without those two years. 
And so I think this hopefully illustrates, sorry for the tears, but <coughs> I hope this hopefully illustrates the importance of all this. Right now, in this moment, we must look back and praise God for his faithful character. We must look up and believe in his gracious care so we can look forward and trust him even during trouble. We um, share in the steadfast character and promises of God, and as we do so, we remember God's steadfastness by sending His only Son into the world to redeem us from our sins. I've asked uh, Carolyn and Wayne to uh, lead us in hymn number 188 in your hymnal this morning. At the cross, you'll find at the bottom of the, uh, of the title there, the message of the cross is the power of God. That's not Carolyn. We're going to go through all four verses and then the chorus at the end. Thank you, Wayne, and uh, Randall. So as we sing this song, we're reminded as we come to receive and take the Lord's Supper, indeed at the cross is what we're remembering, that our Lord, the very maker, creator, the very sustainer, 
of all life, came into this world to redeem us. And so as we come to this point in our service, we would remind you that as we take of this bread and as we drink of this cup, that we're remembering his great sacrifice for us on the cross. If you will, open your uh, cup and take out the bread. And I'll pray now for both the bread and the cup in our sharing together. Heavenly Father, we just remember and rejoice in your steadfast love for us, in your promises that you have kept to us because of the great sacrifice you made in our behalf. Indeed, it was our sins that took you to that cross. And so as we stop and think about that now, may we be renewed in hope and spirit and in love, Lord Jesus, for you and for your sacrifice for us. Now, I'll bless Almighty God as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, and we do so in honor and glory and praise to you, Lord God Almighty. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's share in the bread and in the cup. I've already taken mine. Now, Lord, as we have received these emblems, help us today and throughout this coming week to draw close to you each time remembering your great love shown to us at the cross. We pray this in your holy and righteous name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd remind you that um, the... Offering plates are at the back of the uh, auditorium there, and if you have an offering, uh, please uh, willfully give unto the work and ministry of our Lord, and God will bless you for it. Thank you. And just a reminder that uh, Andy sent an email out that we're going to be going back to regular communion soon. So no more origami communion uh, in the weeks to come. So we look forward to that. It's been a transition for us this year it, from last year with COVID. And as we get back together, it's just a blessing to be in the house of the Lord together. Amen. Um, thank you, John, so much uh, for sharing your word and being vulnerable with us here as, as he talks about how we all can develop trust in the Lord, that we can look back and praise God and his faithfulness and his character by what he's done and, and look up and believe in his gracious care. We, we thank you so much for that and for leading us well today. If you would please stand up and join us as we uh, close out our service together uh, with one final song. <laughs> of the riches of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable His judgments. How untraceable His paths. Who knows the mind of our God? Who can bring counsel to Him? Who has connected to God? Oh,
Would you read this with us? This is from Ephesians chapter 3 as our closing benediction. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed. Have a blessed week.